What's up, boxing fans? I'm Michael Montero for ESPN Deportes. Just kidding. Michael Montero for Boxing Monthly. You're watching the Neutral Corner for the week of July 29th. All right, back from vacation. It kind of really wasn't a vacation. I went to Detroit, my hometown, and just met with a lot of family, ate a lot, drank a lot, had a lot of fun. But it was one of those trips where I feel like more tired after having gone. You know, I'm supposed to feel more rested after going on vacation. But here's a few photos you see of me um, in Detroit with Tiff. We had a great time. Caught a baseball game. Worked out at World's Best Boxing Gym with Coach Jay. That was a lot of fun. We always like to do at least one workout while we're on vacation uh, just to kind of keep the maintenance up because there's so much eating and drinking when you're dealing with family. But uh, really, really good times. Have to be back soon. For those of you who, uh, who I wasn't able to meet up with and I wanted to do a meetup with everybody, I just didn't have time. I was literally overwhelmed by seeing so many family friends while I was there. I'm sorry. Me and Tiff want to come back next year, and instead of doing like a long weekend like we did for this trip, we're going to do like a whole week. So I promise we'll see everybody when we come out next time. But a lot of stuff to catch up on, so let's check out some news and notes. The World Boxing Super Series coming together. Now, I talked before about the different fights that have been made, and I... I figured that Chris Eubank Jr. would beat Arthur Abraham, so he's in now. We know all that, and I'm working on a video. I'm gonna do a video just really breaking down and previewing the whole thing, but we've actually got a few fights scheduled with dates, venues, the whole thing. So September 16th, the whole thing kicks off with Callum Smith fighting Eric Skoglin in Liverpool. So that's kind of in Smith's backyard. September 30th, the WBC Cruiserweight titleist Marius Bredis is fighting Mike Perez in Latvia. So, it, you know, pretty much all these top seeds, they're going to get that first fight in their backyard, obviously. October 14th, George Groves, the WBA super middleweight titleist, defending against Jamie Cox. So that's the first domestic level matchup where you got two UK fighters going head to head in the UK. And as I said before, that super middleweight bracket there's several, I want to say half the fighters are from the UK off the top of my head. So we're going to see several all UK matchups like this. The UK fans have a lot of history with the super middleweight division. So I think that's going to be a lot of fun. That thing's coming together very, very quickly. And I'm looking forward to all those fights, man. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. A couple of fights that uh, might be put together for September 30th. If this card comes together, I like this doubleheader. It would be on Showtime. Jermel Charlo could be defending his WBC 154 pound title against Erickson Lubin. I think that'd be a hell of a fight, man. Jarrett Hurd possibly defending his IBF 154 pound title same night against Austin Trout, which would be another kind of building exercise for, for Hurd, who I think that they're building the right way with the matchups he's had. If both guys who win those two fights, you know, off the top of your head, you got to favor Charlo, you got to favor Hurd. If they win, it's only a no brainer that the two of them unify those titles early next year. And I've been saying it forever. Al Heyman and the PBC have all the junior middleweight titles or almost all of them. They've had them for years. They haven't unified the thing. So these two guys fighting on the same card, it's almost finalized. I think it's going to come together. If that happens and it's on Showtime, that's another strong doubleheader. It'll probably be a triple header. They'll probably throw another fight on this on Showtime. But if the winners of those two fights fight next year, I'm not talking about nine, 10 months from now. I'm talking first quarter next year, January, February, and unify those two titles. 
That's great. And that's good for Premier Boxing Champions. They need that. So let's see. Possibly those fights coming together. One fight that I thought was happening was going to be Deontay Wilder, Luis Ortiz. They were talking about that. It looked like it was a possibility. Now it looks like it's dead in the water. Berman Stavern really through no, doing nothing in the ring, but just through politics and his promoter, Don King. Look, Don King is pretty much out of boxing, but the little shred of power he has left, and Stavern's really his only guy right now, um, he's used that to manipulate his way to get Stavern uh, a mandatory position at the WBC. I know that Showtime has absolutely no interest in paying for that fight. So Premier Boxing Champions is gonna be stuck in a situation where it's gonna be Wilder, Stavern 2, a fight nobody wants. Wilder's gonna want a certain amount, Stavern's gonna want a certain amount. Wouldn't be surprised to see this thing go to purse bid. With budgets and everything the way they are and Showtime not wanting to buy in, I could see that fight being delayed to early next year. Would not surprise me one iota, <clears throat> unless Stavern ends up taking some sort of step aside money, which he's gone on record saying he won't do, but we'll see. Maybe maybe money will talk here. But if Stavern doesn't take step-aside money, we might not see this fight till early next year. We might not see Deontay Wilder fight until next year. Deontay Wilder, I, that career has just been so mishandled. And he, he's stuck fighting a fight that nobody wants here. And, you know, look, man. They say buyer beware. Well, fighter beware when you sign with certain advisors. And, you know, I know a lot of you guys say that I'm too critical of Al Heyman, but this is just another example of just a, a career that's being completely mismanaged. And it's an ongoing thread. And you got undefeated American heavyweight that I've said so many times is right out of central casting for what the, the media here wants to promote in an athlete, particularly in boxing. And the, the guy's a no-name and he rarely ever fights and he hasn't progressed. He hasn't been built up very well. If he ends up fighting Berman Stavern again, and it takes six months or more for that fight to be put together and happen, that's just a damn shame. Other heavyweights that uh, are a damn shame. Shannon Briggs, you guys know he popped for performance-enhancing drugs, and uh, he was going to fight for, I think, an interim or regular version of the WBA heavyweight title, which was a complete crock of shit as it stood anyway. So he, he popped for performance-enhancing drugs, WBA has suspended him for six months. Let's give the WBA some credit. You know, um, I beat up on the WBA a lot, but they suspended the judges who turned in that horrible verdict when Ryota Murata was robbed against the Sam Dam, right? Didn't overturn the decision, but at least they suspended the judges. Other sanctioning bodies have had uh, judges turn in really bad cards, including the IBF, which had a horrible, horrible scorecard uh, a few weeks back on a PBC card, and they haven't done anything about it. The WBA suspended judges earlier this year. Now they're suspending Shannon Briggs for six months. Let's give them that much credit. At least they're doing something. Um, you know, maybe it's just a, a meaningless gesture. I, I don't know. But Shannon Briggs, is he even really a factor in the division? No. We all know he's juicing. It's pretty damn obvious. He got caught just with a basic urine test, I want to say. It wasn't even a blood test. That's how bad the guy's doping. That's some 90 shit. These guys now are so sophisticated with what they're doing, you pretty much got to do a blood test every time to catch them. If you're, I, correct me if I'm wrong in this, but I, you know, I'm still uh, catching up after vacation, but I'm pretty sure he failed, just, or failed a standard piss test. That's pretty damn bad this day and age. So it takes third grade level math to, uh, to beat a piss test in, um, most, with most uh, testing groups. So anyway, Canelo Golovkin, HBO 24-7, airs August 26th. For those of you who are into that, I know that they were filming that um, early this month when both fighters started camp. So um, HBO shot everything. They're chopping it up right now. They're still going to shoot some more stuff. I mean, they always will shoot some more uh, at the end of this month and some stuff early in August, but um, they're already starting to chop things up. So I think, I can't remember if this is one or two episodes. You know, I'm not that big on the 24 sevens. Canelo and Golovkin, neither one is the best interview in the world. They're not going to give you that much. 
but HBO does a good job you know, creating a story. So it'll be interesting to see what they make a story out of here, other than the great matchup itself. But you know, the fighters are never gonna give you, these two fighters, their personalities, they're never gonna give you that much to work with for a show. But HBO will always find something in one of the fighters' camps or their promoter or something to kind of spin to make an interesting story out of. So it'll be interesting to see what they do with that. Shit show updates. Um, you know, you guys know I ain't talking much about Mayweather McGregor. I just, you know, I just don't like the event, period. But uh, I guess some pre-sale tickets went on sale or whatever this week. And they're horribly overpriced. Jim Boone a ticket broker who works a lot with uh, Steve Kim on his, his podcast on the Leave It In The Ring network. Uh, he's been tweeting out a bunch of stuff about this. And I guess there's a $600 plus dollar service charge or convenience fee, whatever they call it, to buy the tickets. They, they've been that high, which is absolutely just a further slap in the face. But Jim Boone, who does this for a living, he's a ticket broker, he knows what he's talking about has been saying that there's basically $7,500 to uh, $10,000 mid-level seats that are horribly overpriced that he doesn't think are going to sell. He actually doesn't think this thing will sell out with tickets priced where they are. Certain sections won't sell out, and he thinks this $7,500 section won't. He actually thinks that tickets will be slashed and cut weeks leading up to the fight. So if for some reason you want to spend thousands of dollars for a complete shit show, I say hold back and wait until a week or two before the fight, and that's what the experts are saying. And um, any of you who would be interested in doing such a thing, let me know. I can get you in touch with a broker who can hook you up and tell you at the right time to buy. So that's it for news and notes. We got a lot of stuff to review, so let's get into the fight review. So for the review, there wasn't a whole lot going on last week, but the week before when I was on vacation, lots of stuff going on. Friday, July 14th, there was an LA Fight Club here in downtown Los Angeles at the Belasco Theater. And um, Edgar Velario improved to 11-0 with six knockouts. 23-year-old featherweight prospect. This is a guy to keep your eye on. For those of you who, um, who haven't seen him yet, Go to Golden Boy's YouTube page, a Ring TV uh, page. You, you can see footage of this guy fighting on some of these LA Fight Club cards. They're building him up. He actually went pro in 2012. He was young when he went pro, really young. And he only had two fights from 2013 to 2015. But, you know, um, he had some issues and everything, working all that stuff out outside the ring. It was okay because he was so young. As I mentioned, he's only 23 right now. He fought five times last year. He's already fought twice this year. So Golden Boy's building him up the right way right now. I think we'll probably see him fight once, probably twice more this year. So check this guy out if you haven't seen him already. Prospect to keep your eye on in a loaded division. Saturday the 15th in Thailand. Tamanun Niyamchong, or as his alias, it goes, Knockout CP Freshmart, one of my favorite names in all of boxing, a Thai fighter, uh, third defense of his WBA minimum weight title with a unanimous decision over 12 rounds. Anytime I see him fight, I just love the Knockout CP Freshmart uh, moniker. That's awesome. I mean, hey, you know what? He's getting paid, you know what I'm saying? So good for him uh, if he's got a good sponsor like that, defending his title. Um, and I think he's probably the best if you're into the minimum weight fighters. You know, those little fighters, man, they deserve respect too. So uh, not too many channels talk about him. I try to on my channel. Now, that day, Saturday, uh, there was a bunch of other fights all around the world. In Wembley, Chris Eubank Jr., who I talked about earlier, wins a unanimous decision over Arthur Abraham, who had trouble making weight, but eventually did. I don't know if it really affected his performance in this fight. He did exactly what I told you guys he was gonna do, what he always does. Shells up, he's hard to hurt because he shells up so good, but he's never in position to punch back. And this fight went exactly the way I told you all it would. Uh, Chris Eubank wins, scores 120, 108, and 118, 110 twice. I have no issue with the 120, 108 score. 
Look, for Arthur Abraham, he carved out a good career for himself. Tough, gritty guy. He fought with a broken jaw. He's fought through injuries. He's fought from behind on the cards to win knockouts before. When he actually sat down on a punch, he could punch pretty hard. I just always felt he was overrated. And at this point, you know, he's pretty much going to serve uh, as a building block for a fighter like Eubank to look really, really good against. That's pretty much where he is at this level in his career. You have to think he's made several million dollars. I don't know why he's going to fight on past this point. I don't know. It might be time for him to do a homecoming farewell kind of a fight in his homeland. And uh, he's an Armenian guy uh, based in Germany. And I don't know if he still has ties to his homeland or not. But it might be time for him to think about that, you know. For Eubank, 25-1, and 1, 19 knockouts. And now he's in that Super 6 uh, or this World Boxing Super Series Tournament Super 6. Ha! <laughs> Uh, he's fighting the Turkish fighter Avni Yildirim, who is 16 0 with 10 knockouts. Uh, you got to figure their first fight's going to be in the UK somewhere, so more to come on that. Also on that card, Lee Selby defended his IBF featherweight title and uh, by a unanimous decision over 12 rounds. Look, Selby now, let's see some unification in the featherweight division. He, he's defended his title a few times now. You've got other titleists at featherweight, Gary Russell, Leo Santa Cruz, Abner Mares, all those guys promotionally, managerially, advisorly can work together and get things done. The only outsider would be Oscar Valdez, who of course is with top rank, who has a title. It's going to be hard for him to get any unification fights, but again... You guys say I'm critical of Heyman and the PBC, but here you go where you've got guys who are either signed with Heyman or have worked with him on shows before um, who have working relationships with him. Gary Russell, Leo Santa Cruz, Abner Mars, Lee Selby. These guys have titles or versions of titles at 126. Let's see some damn unification. Also, Carl Frampton, who I'll talk about later on in the fight preview. He's got a fight coming up this weekend in his homeland, uh, which is a layup, kind of a fight. Should he win that fight, it's only a natural that we should see Carl Frampton and Lee Selby fighting in the UK for that IBF featherweight title. That would only make sense, right? Meanwhile, Leo Santa Cruz could fight Abner Mares in Los Angeles again. The winner of that fight, the winner between the Selby-Frampton fight, unified titles. Gary Russell, he needs to get in the mix as well. These titles need to be unified, particularly when it's they're easy fights to make and they make sense. It needs to start happening in that PBC universe. It doesn't happen enough. So let's go over to this side of the pond, sticking with Saturday, July 15th. In Uniondale, New York, it was PBC on Fox. And I did a rant video about the, the poor ratings for this card, which all things considered when you're in 120 million some odd homes. This thing didn't even average a million viewers. Also, it was on during prime time, 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern time. A lot of fight cards start at 9 Eastern now, and I think that hurts them in the Saturday ratings, particularly if you're on network TV or regular network cable. It's different with premium cable. But all things considered with this card, man, it should have performed better. But you look at the guys that were headlining this thing. It just didn't make sense. Either way, it did do a pretty good crowd. The reason for that is that there were some New York-based fighters on the card that brought some fans out. But also, uh, I've heard that there was some papering. And to be fair, there was a fight card here in Los Angeles that I'll talk about in a second. There was some papering there as well. But let's stick with New York. Omar Figueroa. Third round TKO over Robert Guerrero. Knocks him down three times in the second round. Knocks him down twice in the third round before the thing is over. Right after this fight, Robert the Ghost Guerrero retires. Let's talk real quick about Robert Guerrero, who is one of the nicest guys in boxing outside the ring. Awesome human being. Wonderful family. Can't say enough about the guy. He's done a ton of charitable good work in his community awesome person. But when you look at his boxing career, they always tried to market him as like a four-time world champion. 
I think he won two legitimate world titles. You know, he didn't really beat you know world beaters to, to get those titles, but he had two legit world titles. The other two titles were either like interim titles or something like that. I hate when guys market themselves as a four-time world champion when you two of the belts you held were either interim or in recess or you know diamond, silver, whatever, some other version of the title. Guerrero was legitimately like you're talking 126, 130. I felt a top fighter in those divisions at the time. The titles he won there were legit. Was he the man in the division? Did he clean any division out? Did he have a linear championship? No. But he held two legit world titles. Looking back, five, six, seven, eight years back, during that time, had Guerrero got with a real trainer, relocated, let's say to Oxnard, somewhere down here, and got with uh, Robert Garcia or something, or even went to wildcard with Freddie Roach or um, hell, worked with Virgil Hunter up in the Bay Area, a little bit closer to where Guerrero's from in Gilroy, California, I think he would have progressed. And he really could have been a three or four division world titleist. I don't think he was ever going to be a champion. And you guys know what I define as a champion versus a titleist. I don't think he ever would have been that. But he just seemed to plateau. In fact, he seemed to regress because he worked with his father. And I think he is a clear-cut example of a father-son, fighter-trainer relationship limiting a guy. I think we're seeing the same thing right now with uh, Danny Garcia and his, and his father, Angel Garcia. Danny Garcia was riding high at one point, 140 pounds, and is because his father just isn't a good trainer. Ruben Guerrero, not a good trainer. And you can always tell if a guy's a good trainer or not because you just look at who else has trained with him. To my knowledge, no one else has been trained by Ruben Guerrero and done anything worthy. So I really do think that Robert Guerrero being loyal to his father, not wanting to leave the Gilroy area, basically wanting to train in his backyard, he made sacrifices there. And sometimes that's the difference between a fighter going to that next level. And again, I'm not saying Robert Guerrero was ever going to be a Hall of Famer, but I think he could have carved out a borderline Hall of Fame career. You can make an argument. You know, if he, had he gone to 135 and then 140 and maxed out at 140 and ended up fighting guys like Danny Garcia and stuff at 140. I don't know, man. He, might, he may have done something more with his career, but it goes down to what you want. Do you want to stay at home with your family and you know just kind of maximize what you have there? Or do you want to relocate to another state, another city? For a lot of these guys, it's another country. And... I saw a tweet, someone, I can't remember who it was, tweeted out, it was this week or last week, I don't know, but asking the question, who are the hungriest group of fighters right now? And I saw that and I responded to the tweet and I said, it's the guys who are willing to relocate, sometimes to a new country, assimilate to that country, learn the language, work out in a gym, uproot their entire damn family and move to a new place to get better to improve their career. And we've seen a lot of fighters from Eastern Europe doing that. We've seen some fighters from Mexico and Latin America, from Cuba, do that uh, in different ways. But Robert Guerrero is a case for me, a clear-cut example of a guy who got the most out of his toughness, his grit, him being in good condition, but never excelled or got better with his craft because he wanted to stay comfortable at home and work with his father. So, you know what? He still carved out a very good career. He made millions of dollars. And of all the PBC fighters, it's Guerrero and Adrian Broner who have made out the most out of this whole PBC deal. You look at just their two careers, where they were at when this PBC thing started, particularly Guerrero. Guerrero probably fought more than any of these guys on these PBC cards. He was willing to take less money to stay busy and fight more often. And he did that in this fight as well. He took a, a pay cut. Uh, he's taken several of them. He's lost like four of his last six, five of his last seven. So, you know, it was justifiably so. But 
he made out from this PBC deal because I don't know how many other promoters would have headlined him on a Fox card uh, like this. So our, Omar Figueroa gets the W here as a welterweight. He's not a welterweight. He's a part-time boxer. I don't see any future for Omar Figueroa. And at one point when he was, I think, a lightweight, he had a bright future. Again, he was never going to be a Hall of Famer, but he was going to be in some title fights and he could have made for some good, good fights over the years. But he's pretty much an afterthought. I don't see where he goes from here. If he can get down to 140, even at 147, he'll serve as a gatekeeper or somebody for you know these prospects to make a name off of. But that's it. I don't see much more from Figueroa. He beat down a complete ghost of a ghost in Robert Guerrero in this fight. Enough about that fight. Marcus Brown scores a second round TKO over Sean Monaghan, who he dropped in the first round. He is now 20-0 with 15 knockouts. I haven't really been sold on Marcus Brown. I'm not big on him, but I'm starting to pay a little more attention now. He's looked pretty good in his last few fights. He's six foot one. 75 inch reach. He's only 26 years old. He's a southpaw. He's rated number seven, I believe, by the WBC right now. I'm not saying he beat Adonis Stevenson right now. I don't think he's quite ready for that, but he's one fight away from it. I'd like to see, again, PBC, Al Heyman, natural progression here. Stevenson is eventually going to fight Eladir Alvarez. The winner of that fight you know, keep Marcus Brown busy in the meantime, get him a fight, and then put him in there with the winner of that fight. You know, or else Marcus Brown, I'm sure Andre Ward's titles are going to get split up because he's going to have mandatories he doesn't want to fight. He's going to sit on the shelf for too long. Maybe Marcus Brown could go after one of those titles. I don't know how he rate, you know, stacks up against like an Alexander Gavajdik and, and guys like that, or even a Sullivan Barrera. Don't think he's quite there yet, but it'll be interesting one, two fights down the road to see if he can progress a little bit and how he would look against one of those guys. In the heavyweight opener, Adam Kovnaki approves the 16-0 with a fourth-round TKO over Arthur Spielka, who he knocked down the fourth round before stopping him, who looked absolutely freaking shot. This was a two guys born in Poland. Kovnaki has moved, and I think he lives in New York and Brooklyn, I think now. I think a lot of Polish fans showed up for that fight. In fact, I think the, the, the decent crowd that this card did was coming out for the Brown and Monaghan fight, and particularly this Polish fight. Nobody was there for the main event. So, but that's it with that PBC card. And again, I don't really know. There was nothing established or built out of that card. There's no real future story out of it. Sean Monaghan should have been fighting... Joe Smith Jr. earlier this year. That's not all on the PBC. There was, you know, a different promoter there, uh, Artie Palulo, with, um, with, with Smith that I think failed him. They, there was a big missed opportunity there. But this card doesn't really build to anything. It was just kind of a haphazard, thrown together card that would have been just fine on Spike TV or, or an entity like that. But on Fox, just a really missed opportunity, I think, by PBC. Okay. Now, on to Los Angeles, or Inglewood to be exact, in the forum. It was a triple header on HBO, and you know, I, I had really high expectations for this card. It, it, it was a little underwhelming. It didn't quite live up to the expectations. And sometimes this happens. Sometimes you're salivating, something looks really great on paper, but it just doesn't quite translate in the ring. And that's kind of what we saw here. So. In the main event, Miguel Burchelt scores a unanimous decision over Takashi Miura. He dropped him in the first round. Miura recovered. And they pretty much just boxed. There were some moments of action. It was a good quality fight, just not a great one. And we were expecting maybe a slugfest. But Burchelt has been stopped before. And he looked very cautious in this fight. I think Miura tagged him a few times. He was like, whoa, this guy's strong. If Miura can do anything, it's punch. And he's bailed himself out in tough fights before with the big punch. Um, but as it stands, Burchelt shows another wrinkle to his game. And he shows that he can box a little bit. And he defends his WBC super featherweight title. Now, in the co-main, Jazreel Corrales defended his super featherweight title 
with a technical decision over in 10 rounds over Robinson Castellanos. So Corrales was knocked down twice in the fourth and Castellanos was dropped in the seventh round. For me, this fight exceeded expectations. And you guys know, as this fight got closer, the episode where I was previewing this one, I told you, and I even said it in an episode of, of, of 10 Count that we, that we filmed uh, for Undisputed Champion Network, that Castellanos, you know, at first I'm like, ah, this is a mismatch, but just enough awkward, just enough toughness there, all that together to give Corrales some issues. And he did in this fight. I thought it was very, very close and competitive. But uh, Corrales, or I'm sorry, Castellanos was cut from headbutts. I think he was cut twice in two different rounds. And Corrales was cut by a punch. And eventually this thing was stopped because of the cuts. I didn't feel they needed to stop it. I thought that, you know, there was two more rounds, two and a half more rounds. I thought that maybe they could have been given a warning of, hey, uh, you know, one more round and we're stopping it. I just, I hate seeing, it's one thing if you get a bad cut and skull is showing and right there on the spot, you stop a fight. I think that happened once with Vladimir Klitschko versus, I want to say it was Devero Williamson, where they clashed heads and literally the ring doctor could see Klitschko's skull, could separate the cut and see, see bone. And right then and there, stopped it. Pretty much right then and there. But these guys were cut and fighting for several rounds. And it was such a close competitive fight. I, I just hate that it was stopped when it was. But as it stands, uh, Corrales got the decision. Now, some people didn't agree with it. They thought Castellanos should have got the decision. But based on what I saw and based on what people have told me who were there, my brother actually attended this card when I was in Detroit. He covered this card. He was ringside. And uh, he covered it for Boxing News 24. And he felt that Corrales won. And I know several people felt Corrales won, people that I trust. So I don't have a problem with this decision. As it stands, you know, I talked about the PBC card not having anything to build on. Well, here you have Burchelt and Corrales defending their titles. Boom. Let's see him unify. Um, Burchelt and Miura fought in January on the same card. They both won, they both fought in this card. Now you can do the same kind of thing. And the ratings for Burchelt back in January, I wanna say they averaged around 400 some odd thousand. Of course, that was the same night Carl Frampton and Leo Santa Cruz had their rematch. So that kind of hurt the ratings of that card. But you go from 400 and something thousand average to 700 or so thousand average in this fight. So they almost doubled the average viewership. It was something like 70% increase. That's because the storyline's being built, right? And right after this fight, you know, they're already talking about Burchelt and Corrales unifying the thing. And then there's Vasil Lomachenko, who, yes, top rank has moved over to ESPN now. Lomachenko's fighting there. But nothing in that deal says that top rank can only fight on ESPN. So perhaps something down the line could be worked out where there could be a complete unification at 130 pounds if these guys start unifying titles. We'll see. Either way, HBO is something to build on with those two fights, right? So the opener, the light heavyweight opener, Sullivan Barrera beats Joe Smith by unanimous decision. Uh, Joe Smith broke his jaw earlier, I want to say in the first, second round. Pretty much fought the entire fight with a broken jaw. He dropped Barrera in the first round, but Barrera recovered. He adjusted to Smith's power. He started boxing, and I thought this was pretty much a shutout. So, look, part of me thought that Smith was going to catch Barrera, um, but it didn't happen. He caught him in the first round, and sometimes in a fight like that where you, where you catch a guy early, it kind of messes you up. It's a little too easy. That combined with the broken jaw, uh, it turned into a boxing match. And Barrera just has better boxing skills, top to bottom. And he's been working on his craft, improving. I still say those 12 rounds that he went with, uh, with Andre Ward has made his career. He took an L, but so what? He's improved so much since then. And um, this was a great, great win for Barrera. 
And I just think that, again, Joe Smith missed opportunity. Joe Smith should have fought Shawnee Monahan March, April, somewhere in that time frame in New York, the same venue that the PBC just had that card in Uniondale, Long Island. That should have happened. You know, his people should have capitalized on all that momentum he had from last year. They didn't do it. And now they got in there with a killer. And I think Sullivan Barrera might be the second best light heavyweight in the world right now. He's at least in the top three or four. Proven himself. Uh, I think that he'd give Andre Ward a real push in a rematch should that happen. I really, really do. I think he's improved. And, you know, Smith went right up to Sullivan Barrera. Ooh. Well, there's a career that was completely mismanaged and a huge miss opportunity for him. I don't know where Joe Smith goes from here. I know that he always makes for exciting fights. This wasn't particularly exciting, but he was fighting with a broken jaw. Now, he was thoroughly outboxed, but if he didn't have a broken jaw, perhaps he would have took more risks and went for the kill. I guess we'll never know. Either way, Sullivan Barrera needs to be on HBO again very soon. And they're talking about matching him with Sergey Kovalev toward the end of this year. Maybe it's November, somewhere in that time frame. I think that'd be awesome. I think that would be an awesome ending for what has been an outstanding year in boxing in 2017. And HBO had a dreadful start to the year. Absolutely dreadful. But if they finish out the year, I mean, they've got some great cards scheduled, man. I mean, this was a good card. But that super flag card coming up in September is amazing, top to bottom. And there's plenty to build on with that card, right? There's going to be tons of fights that are built up from, from the, the results of that card. If you have Sullivan Barrera fight Sergey Kovalev on regular HBO toward the end of this year, man, HBO is finishing strong. All right, one last card to cover. The following week, Sunday... July 23rd, this was last Sunday over in Tokyo, a couple of Japanese titleists defended their titles. Hiroto Kayoguchi defended his IBF minimum weight title. And I bring this up because I just talked about knockout CP Freshmark. You got a Thai fighter, Japanese fighter. Look, traditionally, the Thai promoters like to stick to themselves. The Japanese promoters like to stick to themselves and just defend their own versions of the titles. Wouldn't it be great to see these two guys fight and unify the title? It'd be really, really nice. Maybe I'm just wishing too much here, but, you know, just fucking unify the titles, guys. The other fight, uh, Ryuichi Taguchi defends his WBA 108-pound title. That's junior flyweight. So both of those Japanese titleists keep their titles in Tokyo. That's it for all the review. We're all caught up. Now let's preview what's coming up this weekend. Friday in Shanghai, China, a city that I visited a few years ago, was in Shanghai for a week. Absolutely fucking amazing. I would love to go back. Zhou Ximing defending his WBO featherweight title against a Japanese opponent who has fought absolutely nobody, has absolutely no business, fighting for this title. I believe he did win an elimination uh, fight, not his last fight, but two fights ago, at least to bump him up in the ratings somehow. I don't know if it was an el eliminator, but it bumped him up in the WBO ratings. It was a fight he was supposed to lose and he won in an upset. I can't remember who it was against, but his Japanese opponent lost his pro debut, hasn't even fought a guy with 10 or more wins yet. Hasn't even fought. Has barely fought any 10 rounders or anything like that. So. You got to favor Zhou Ximing big in this fight. But Zhou Ximing's career, look, it's kind of uh, smoke and mirrors. Not kind of. It is. It's smoke and mirrors. He's not even among, I don't even know if he's a top 10 flyweight. He has a title. The WBO is big into the Asian titles and um, or into the Asian countries, the Asian markets. And top rank, who promotes Ximing, is big, big into the WBO. They do a lot of business together. So, Ximing's going to have this title for a long time. His legacy will be that he helped blow up the boxing market in China. He's not going to be seen as a Hall of Famer or anything like that. He, again, probably not even a top 10 flyweight. But when he fights, you're talking a country of over a billion people. 
Tens of millions of people watch this guy fight. That's significant. So regardless of what you feel about Zhou Ximeng, you know, was in multiple Olympics, multiple medals, and then as a pro, he really start to, started to establish a true boxing market in China. And look, I still say within the next 20 years, we're gonna have a Japanese heavyweight titleist. I've been saying that for a while and people laugh at me. I think it's gonna happen and Zhou Ximing is gonna open up floodgates. You're gonna start seeing more and more Chinese fighters. The country has over a billion people. If people there start boxing, there's gonna be some talent that comes out of that damn country. It's a big country. All right, Saturday the 29th, this Saturday, over in Belfast, Northern Ireland, Carl Frampton, who I talked about earlier, uh, making his return from the loss to Leo Santa Cruz in January in their rematch. Um, hasn't fought in Belfast since February of 2015. So this is sort of a homecoming. It's been, you know, two, two and a half years. I think he needs this layup. That's pretty much what it is. He's going up against a Mexican fighter, Andres Gutierrez, who uh, is coming off almost a one-year layoff. Hasn't fought since October of last year. Has a nice record, 35-1-1 one one with 25 knockouts, but all but two of his fights have been in Mexico. I think he's fought in the United States. I believe Las Vegas, if I'm not mistaken, twice, just on, on pay-per-view undercards. But uh, he hasn't really fought anybody. So he's making a quantum leap in opposition. But he's a tough Mexican coming over to win, so he'll make for some excitement. I think that this will be just what Carl Frampton needs. It's going to be a rabid fan base there in Belfast. Frampton has a great, great fan base. And... Should he come out of this fight with no big injuries, no big bumps, bruises, he's talked about Lee Selby. He needs to call him out and the need to make that fight before the end of this year. We should see Selby and Frampton fight if he comes out of this thing unscathed, which I think he will. And that leaves us to the big card here in the United States, in Barclays, in Brooklyn. Now, I did a Monday Minute, which I haven't done one of those in a while, about the main event between Mikey Garcia and Adrian Broner. Yes, guys, the video itself is three minutes long, but my breakdown is 60 seconds. That's why I call it Montero's Monday Minute. So check that out. And I'm wearing a crazy hat, and I've gotten a lot of shit for the hat. <laughs> the hat will never be seen again. It's a, it's a hat that me and Tiffany got for free. We went to a San Diego Padres game, and they were giving them out. And I didn't feel like combing my hair when I shot the video. So there, that explains the hat. And uh, I probably deserve all the shit I'm getting for wearing it because it's a pretty ugly hat. Anyway, this is a good card from PBC. Look, I'm critical of them when it's required. There's a lot to be critical about. But this is a nice card. My only issue is the fight I'm most interested in apparently is not going to be part of the Showtime broadcast. And I don't understand that. It's not even going to be on Showtime Extreme, as I understand it. Now, hopefully, they make a last-minute decision and get this sorted out and they stream it on their YouTube page, something. But as of now, Jarrell Big Baby Miller and Gerald Washington, heavyweight fight between two heavyweight prospects. Um, it's not going to be seen anywhere except for those who are in the arena in Barclays. And by the way, ticket sales for this thing, not going very well. They're gonna to have to paper this thing, which I think they do with most of these Barclays cards. But Jarrell Big Baby Miller, 18-0-1, 16 knockouts, six foot four, 78 inch reach, big guy, a lot of experience. Sparred with the Klitschko brothers for a while, was one of their chief sparring partners for a while, uh, particularly Vladimir. He's out of Brooklyn, I think he's West Indian, heritage, but he uh, grew up in Brooklyn, 29 years old. He went pro in 2009. Hasn't fought often enough for a prospect. He's got a background in kickboxing and MMA and all that stuff, but uh, converted to boxing, I want to say in his early 20s, maybe late teens, some, somewhere around there. But, uh, you know, got a late start in boxing. His biggest issue is weight. They call him Big Baby. He is a big baby. Now, people say he's athletic. He wears the weight well. I don't give a shit. His last five fights, 255, 280, 274, 283, 296. 
296 for his last fight, and that was last August. So coming off a year layoff just about, and he was 296. Now, 255, which is where he was a few years back, maybe a couple years back, that's where he should be. I thought he was too big even then. He should be in the 250s. I think this is another guy, like, I love Jarrell Miller's personality. He talks a great game. I think he's skilled. I do think he's athletic. I think with all his fight experience in different martial arts, not just boxing, but kickboxing, a little bit of wrestling, his experience sparring with the Klitschko's, that taught him a lot. It taught him how to be comfortable in the ring. For all of that, Wade's going to kill this guy. Wade's going to kill him. And he's eventually going to get, a, he's going to get in there with an opponent who he can't bully with his weight. That's what he's done so far. And he's fighting Gerald Washington, who has a very similar record. 18-1-1. Gerald Washington went pro in 2012. So he went pro three years later than Miller, but he's got actually one more fight than he does. He's got 20 pro fights to, to Miller's 19. So Washington's been busier. Gerald Washington, of course, uh, fought Deontay Wilder in February, and I thought he was winning that fight at the time it was stopped. I think he won the first three rounds. It wasn't until the fourth round that Deontay Wilder started to kick in the gear, and then I think the knockout happened in the fifth. But Washington is six foot six, 82 inch reach, 35 years old. He's a lot older than Miller, another guy who got to boxing late. But unlike Miller, who had a martial arts background and just decided on boxing to be his martial art of choice. Washington had a football background and then moved to boxing. He boxed a little bit in his youth, but not seriously like Miller did, right? So here, here's the interesting X factor here, okay? Those five rounds Washington had with Deontay Wilder, who's bigger, stronger, maybe not stronger than, than Miller. We don't know yet, but Wilder is certainly, I think, more athletic, faster, taller, longer than Miller. Miller might be better skilled, but Washington has those five rounds against Wilder in Wilder's backyard, and he has that footage he can watch and learn from and see what he did wrong. He's taller than Miller. He's longer than Miller. He's in better shape than Miller. I think Miller has better hand speed and better foot speed, but... This is going to be the first opponent for Miller that he can't bully around with weight. He's not going to be able to just move Washington wherever he wants to get his punches off. He's going to have to jab his way in. He's going to have to slip Washington's jab. The one thing about Jared Washington that I've always said, he has almost no head movement. He, he boxes like a football player, very squared up, and it, it, you know, he doesn't move his head. Football players aren't very agile with, with their uh, hips. Some are. Don't shit all over me, football players. But a lot of football is squaring up and nailing a dude, drilling them, right? That's, you know, if you're playing linebacker position, you're getting low, you're squaring up, you're hitting a guy with your shoulders, and you're knocking him down. You're tackling him. Boxing's so different than that. So different than that. The way the stance works and the way the movements work. It's more applicable, I would say, to the NBA or even to the NHL, to like a hockey player, with the nimbleness of it. And for Washington, the head movement, can he move his head suddenly in this fight? But more than that, his offensive output is very, very low. And I think for him to have a chance of winning this fight and pulling the upset here, and I do think he has a better chance than a lot of people are giving him. A lot of people think Jarrell Miller is just going to plow through Washington. And I understand why I have that point of view. But if Washington keeps a jab pumping in Miller's face, he might be able to get a right hand over that jab. Now, is he going to turn into an offensive machine overnight? Is he going to learn from those five rounds with Wilder uh, six months ago, about six months ago? I don't know. We'll find out. Conventional wisdom is that Miller comes in there and mows Washington down in attempts to make a statement. It took Wilder five rounds to beat Washington, and he lost rounds in that fight. Miller has been calling out Deontay Wilder for a while. He wants to make a statement here and get rid of Washington in a more spectacular fashion. If he does that, if he dominates from the opening bell, walks right through Washington, weighs in less than 296 than his last fight, and looks impressive, 
That's going to get people talking. That's what Miller needs to do to back up all that damn talking he does. If this thing ends up going to the cards, that's just a bad look. Washington has a chance here. He does have a chance, but he's going to have to step up his offensive output and move his damn head. Now, the cold feature, Jermel, Jamal Charlo, Jamal Charlo, uh, who has moved up to middleweight. His last fight was back in December when he beat Julian J. Rock Williams by knockout. He vacated his title, moved up to middleweight. He is now going up against Jorge Sebastian Highland, a fighter from Argentina who has fought absolutely nobody. Rugged fighter, has some skills. I do think he will go some rounds with Charlo. Uh, he's a southpaw, so he's awkward, you know. 29-4-2, and two, only 16 knockouts. Highland is perfect matchmaking for Charlo. I think he's perfect. Charlo is 25-0 and 0 with 19 knockouts. Uh, six feet tall, 73-inch reach. I think this kid, I think both Charlos are really starting to come into their own. And I think this kid might be the future of the middleweight division. This is set up for Highland to have a couple of moments early on to hang tough. But by the middle of rounds, I think Charlo is going to get him out of there. The one thing about Highland, he's lost four times. He's had two draws. He's never been stopped. If Charlo can stop him, that makes a statement. So, and for those of you asking, both of these guys are in Vada's clean boxing program. So, um, you know, I know a lot of questions are out there about the Charlos and performance enhancing drugs and speculation. Vada clean boxing program. So, innocent until proven guilty, guys. And on to the main event, Adrian Broner, Mikey Garcia. This is really, truly a crossroads fight. And when this thing first got signed, it kind of came out of left field. Nobody was really expecting this. Um, a lot of people thought that this was basically Al Heyman and the PBC cashing out on Broner. Because he's had, you know, his nickname is The Problem, and he's had a lot of problems outside the ring. He's been inconsistent inside the ring. For whatever reason, Broner is one of those fighters that um, I just feel a lot of fans have this vision in their mind of what he could have been. And they hang on to that and see him as this special talent, this special fighter. If only he could have did X, Y, Z. And there's several guys like this every generation. You know, for me, Broner is a good quality fighter. He's got a lot of skills, but he's not flawless. And having skills is just part of being a good boxer. Boxing takes an, an extra dimension that you don't necessarily need in other sports. You know, um, in other sports where you play 82 games a year like, like the NBA or 162 games a year like Major League Baseball, or even in football where, yeah, you only play 16 games a year, but every play is 10 seconds at a time and there's a second string, a third string, there's a halftime, there's timeouts, you can kind of get by half-assing it sometimes. You can kind of float. You don't have to go 100% all the time. To be a really great boxer... It takes so much more than just skills. You've got to have extreme discipline. You've got to live uh, a Spartan lifestyle outside the ring. It doesn't mean you can't live a little bit in between camps, but you can't be fluctuating up and down the weight. You can't drink too much. You can't do drugs. And just all this stuff with Broner has killed him. And you could talk about potential all day, but potential doesn't mean shit. It's about what you've done. Now, Broner is, again, a good quality fighter. I wouldn't vote for him for Hall of Fame. I know he's, I think, a four-division titleist, but the titles he's won, for the most part, are against limited opposition. Uh, none of the titles were against the guy who was seen as the man in the division. He's never stayed and cleaned anything out. He's been lucky to escape with some decisions over guys that not everyone agreed with. So he's been very, very fortunate. And then you have Mikey Garcia who does live more of a Spartan lifestyle outside the ring, is a good family guy, soft-spoken, um, doesn't blow up in weight between fights, hasn't gotten in a lot of trouble. So he's the complete opposite of Broner in that way. But, you know, if you really start looking at his career, he hasn't faced the best opposition either. And in my estimation, I think Broner's faced the better fighters. 
Now, Broner's lost those fights, but let's look at the top three fights each guy, or top three fighters each guy's faced, okay? For Mikey Garcia, it's Orlando Salido, who just isn't that good. Dirty fighter who kind of caught a very green Vasil Lomachenko in his second pro fight. Weight bullied, foul fest, really should have been a no contest, but that's his claim to fame. Orlando Salido is made for some great fights of the year, fight of the year contenders, but he's not a guy that you would consider an elite level fighter. That might be Mikey Garcia's best opponent, probably his best performance because he really dominated Salido. Juan Manuel Lopez, he fought a past prime uh, chinny guy, Juan Manuel Lopez, who had been stopped before, didn't fight the best version of Juan Ma. And then Roman Martinez, who is really just tailor-made for Garcia's style. So those are the three best fighters he's faced. Now, Adrian Broner, Pauli Malignaggi, who I'm not saying was elite, but at the best point in, in Pauli's career, highly skilled and experienced fighter. Marcos Maidana, again, not elite, but a good quality, rugged fighter with power, awkward, who had some good wins on his ledger. And then Sean Porter, who is a tough night at the office for anybody. Now, again, the difference between Garcia's top three and Broner's top three is Garcia won his. He dominated his top three fights. Broner lost to Maidana, lost to Porter, took a beating against Maidana, and got a split decision win over Pauly, but many, many people feel that Pauly deserved a decision in that fight. So, which is it? Is it that Broner's more proven and all that experience against those fighters, win, lose, or draw, is going to help him uh, kind of school Garcia a little bit, who's too green against, you know, he just hasn't faced the level of opposition Broner has? Or is it that Garcia, every time he has stepped up slightly, has dominated so thoroughly and he's going to do the same thing here? He just hasn't had the opportunity to do it against a guy like Broner yet. Which is it? Now... Since 2014, Garcia's only had three fights, and it's been against limited opposition. Broner has had seven fights in that span against good opposition. Again, he, he's lost some of those fights, but you compare these two guys, I mean, on paper, you want to say Broner would almost be favored in some circles. Again, and I talked about this in my uh, Monday Minute breakdown, Broner's had nine fights at 140 or more pounds. Garcia hasn't had any. He's had only one fight at lightweight. He's had four fights at 130 or more. So they're both the same height. They're both about 5'6", 68", 69 inch reach. But Broner is the thicker, naturally stockier, naturally stronger guy. He also has faster hands. Probably has better upper body and head movement as well. But... Garcia is the more consistent worker. And if you stand right in front of Mikey Garcia or move straight in, straight out, he's going to eventually time you and it's going to be target practice. I think Broner in the early rounds of this fight is, is going to display skills that give Garcia a little trouble. And the thing is, th these are both natural counter punchers. So I could see the first two, three, four rounds really being a whole lot of fainting and nothing. And because of styles, depending on who the judges are, but just the way PBC judges tend to go, I think that the judges will favor Broner's spoiling over Garcia's fainting and occasional jab. I think it's going to be early, uh, early on, it's going to be um, very technical and dull, but I think that into the middle rounds, Garcia's straight punches and his jab, which I want, I think once he gets his jab pumping and starts timing Broner and what he wants to do, I don't see Broner overnight suddenly having a bunch of lateral movement and being able to fight backing up. Those have never been Broner's strengths. His strengths have been being able to stand in the pocket, pick off your shots, make you miss, and counter with his fast hand speed. I think he's going to be able to do that in spots early on against Garcia. But I think toward the middle rounds, Garcia is going to start to wear him down. You know, Broner, 
is cutting down to 140 pounds for this fight. And you guys have probably all seen the pictures on Twitter that were posted of, of Broner and Camp, looking like a corpse almost. I think that this has pretty much been a fat camp for him. And having to cut all that weight, you know, his last fight was at 147. And that was originally supposed to be contracted, I don't know, I think it was against um, Adrian Granados. I think it was supposed to be, it was at a catch weight. I can't remember, but they kept changing at 142, 144. And they settled at 147. This fight, it's a half million dollars, I believe, for every pound that Broner comes over. And his career is on the line. He does not want to give up part of his purse. He's got a thousand kids to feed, a bunch of uh, law charges to, you know, um, me uh, not medical costs, lawyer fees and shit like that to pay off. He needs that damn money. I think he's going to make weight. I think he's going to make 140 pounds. And I think he'll rehydrate well. But come into the middle rounds, that's going to start working on him. And I think Garcia starts to wear him down and, and soften him up with the jab and land some straight right hands. Maybe he drops him. I don't know. I, I, I've gone back and forth uh, about a stoppage. I just think that because Broner is the naturally bigger, stronger guy, and he has shown heart, and I do think that he realizes now his career is on the line. I think he gets it. You look at the way he fought against Maidana, who just beat him down. Broner finished on his feet. He was hurt in that fight. He needed help walking out of the ring into the locker room. Broner does have heart. I know a lot of people have brought up comparisons to um, Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. is not a natural born fighter like Broner, has not shown the heart or even the passion or desire that Broner has. And I know Broner's inconsistent. I get you. But when the going got tough against Maidana, and he, there was even times against Sean Porter where uh, he was getting hurt, Broner fought back. And he actually dropped Porter late in that fight. So because of those reasons, I do think this fight goes the distance. I just think Garcia is more consistent, has more levels, and that lifestyle of Broner's and the weight cut will catch up to him. I think this is going to be an underwhelming main event. I just do. I think the fight of this card will be that heavyweight fight. The knockout of this card will be the co-main, and this main event's going to underperform. It might look a little bit like, not, not style-wise, but it might look a little bit like the burchelt uh, Miura fight a week or two ago where it's it's just it doesn't quite live up to expectations and it's a little more of a boxing match than people expect so guys that's the way i see it it's good to be back let me know what you think like comment share subscribe i'll see you at the fights